I will start with a land acknowledgement. Ecamps Ontario offices are in downtown Toronto, located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis. I personally join you today from Toronto, which is situated on the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Wendat peoples. And I recognize and I'm grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. In this virtual space, we're all convening from different places. This is one of the things that makes the online environment special. So I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. You may use the link that Mary will drop in the chat to know which traditional territories you're joining us from. I also wanna share a ministry acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to thank the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities for their investment in the virtual learning strategy. The VLS drives growth and advancement in virtual learning across the province's post-secondary institutions. We will also drop the link to the VLS in the chat if you would like to learn more about this initiative. So without further ado, let me introduce Nicolette Kadiri, Professor of Liberal Studies from the Humber Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. Um, Nicolette will present today the Black Experience in Canada online course. She will provide an overview of the unit and themes that and will explain what students and faculty can expect from the course. Nicolette will also present the thematic design as well as the vision behind the creation of this course. So definitely take advantage of the session, listen to it and um, take the chance to ask any questions that you have in the Q&A section. We will have time at the end of the session to go over them. So without further ado, um, Professor Nicolette, the screen is yours. I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can share, go ahead and share yours. Awesome. Thank you so much for um, that introduction. And I just wanted to... Um, First off, say I'm so happy to be here. And <clears throat> I wanted to first off as well, uh, first, let me see if any, everyone can see. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to give um, brief thanks to um, the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Innovative Learning at Humber College uh, for recommending me to um, create this project. I wanted to also um, give thanks to Susan Hexmere, who is the Chair of Liberal Studies at George Brown, um, who approached me to also do this project. Uh, it was such a joy. And uh, this project was really a collaboration between George Brown and Humber College. Uh, I wanna also give a thanks to Jamia Zubri, who also assisted me in writing this course, who is another educator and brilliant mind, and I really appreciate her work and um, effort on this project. So it really gives me great joy to present to you um, the Black Experiences in Canada course. Um, what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time to explain um, the vision uh, behind uh, the design that I had for this course, um, and then get into uh, what the course is about and what um, students and faculty can expect from the course. Okay. <clears throat> so in looking at um, the Black Experiences in Canada course, um, the vision that went behind how I wanted to create this course uh, really centered on um, wanting to bring Black experiences to the forefront. Black experiences by way of whether it be accomplishments, um, the contributions to um, Canada, um, systems of oppression. I wanted to take those experiences that are often marginalized and silenced and center them. Um, also, I wanted this course um, to be designed in a way where it would challenge the dominant cultural narratives that posit Canada as a post-racial uh, and or non-racist uh, society. 
And I wanted to create a course that would definitely pay homage to um, the contributions um, of Black people to this um, nation. Also wanted to address the misconceptions around racial and cultural um, identity. And I wanted to create a course that would foster productive dialogue on the topic of race. So this was my vision um, going into um, designing this course the way that I did in terms of the content and also in terms of the assessments. At this time, I'd like to go through a course overview to give you all a better understanding of what the course is actually about, what it talks about, and what students and faculty will have an opportunity to do in the course. So students will have an opportunity to engage in a variety of content that will center on Black experiences in Canada through an analysis of various art forms, including literature, poetry, music, and theory. The course will garner a deeper understanding of systems of oppression and self-realization as it returns to living and interacting in Canadian society. Students will also reflect on the process of self-care and healing while attending to their relationship within systems of oppression. Using collaborative discussions and personal reflections, learners will analyze the dynamics of Black cultural identity and its contribution to shaping Canada as a nation. Students will also become familiar with forms of Black activism, as well as political and social reform demonstrations that culminated into movements for social change. This course will also facilitate a greater understanding in conversations about race by encouraging students to explore both the conditions under which race talk happens and to reflect on the process of the emotions associated with race talk. So in this course, both students and faculty will have an opportunity to analyze works of art and culture, analyze the effect of systemic oppression, anti-Black racism and social reform movements, and explain acts of resistance and personal stories of resilience all within the context of the Black experience in Canada. There'll also be an opportunity to examine what work needs to be done to identify and validate the process of healing. Also an opportunity to talk about race in ways that reinforce the need for honesty and compassion, openness, empathy, and inclusion. So this course is uh, designed um, through five units. And I wanted to design this course using a thematic design because part of the thinking behind um, creating this course is I wanted to motivate students out of a desire for enjoyment um, and personal interest. So the course is split up into five units, um, all of which have two to three weeks worth of lessons with the exception of unit two, which is the largest unit, it is five weeks, and unit four, which is the shortest unit, which is one week. So unit one is referred to art, culture, and identity. And starting the course with that unit was very intentional, um, only because when we talk about Black experiences or we talk about Black history, there is a tendency to believe that uh, Black history or Black experiences begins and ends with slavery. And so it was very intentional in the creation of this course for um, there to be a recognition that Black history, Black experience incorporates culture and identity. While oppression is a part of that, it's not the whole story. So unit one, art, culture, and identity. Unit two, being Black in Canada. Unit three, fight the power. Unit four, healing. And unit five, conversations about race. And just saying a little bit about um, the themes of these units, uh, being Black in Canada, fight the power, healing, and conversations about race, I wanted to use themes that um, touch on some of the experiences of Black people in Canada. And so for being Black in Canada, um, I remember I'm the you know, child of immigrant parents who came here and I, and I think about what my experiences were being born in Canada. Um, and what my experiences were as a 
uh, black person. And so it runs the whole gamut, a number of experiences I had. And so I wanted to incorporate in the course an opportunity to talk about um, those experiences, some of the experiences of being black in Canada. And for unit three, um, the inspiration behind that uh, theme, Fight the Power, I remember, and I might be dating myself here, but back in the 1990s, it was Public Enemy, which was a hip hop group, and they had the song Fight the Power. And <clears throat> that was very inspirational to me because it speaks to a long history of um, Black people being resilient, um, being resistance against oppression in various forms, um, and fighting the uh, systemic powers that be. Uh, that maintain discriminatory policies and practices. Uh, unit four is particularly, I would find phenomenal, I would say phenomenal. Um, unit four was one of the units that Jamia Zubri um, uh, assisted with and created for this course. And uh, for unit four, it is an opportunity to look at uh, the different uh, methods of healing uh, as a result of societal trauma. And then unit five, uh, conversations about race, my inspiration behind that was thinking about all of the um, times where I've had conversations about race in the classroom with family members, um, with uh, friends, with colleagues. And so again, I wanted to put together a course thematically that would touch on um, the experiences, some of the experiences of, of Black people in Canada. So at this time, I'm going to take um, just a little bit of time to just give you an idea of what uh, each of um, the units entail. So for unit one, this was the unit that Jamia Zubri uh, worked on, and she did a phenomenal job. Um, in this unit, um, students have an opportunity to look at uh, various artists in Canada and the work that they have done, and they have an opportunity to look at um, how art addresses um, identity. And uh, they'll also have an opportunity to look at four black um, female artists, uh, poets and advocates, and look at how their work gives voice to black experiences in Canada. And then um, the last week of this unit will be an examination of black pride. So looking at art, culture, and identity through a queer lens. Unit two, um, the largest of the units, um, is five weeks. It covers the following topics. Uh, Black Canada, Dear Black People, Dear White People, Black Lives Matter Two, and Black Queer Lives Matter. Um, hashtag Black Canada is really where we begin a conversation about the conditions under which Black people came to Canada. Um, and uh, we do talk about slavery. We talk about the nature of slavery in Canada. Uh, we address Canadian um, slavery mythology. So the stories that some of us have been told, um, but we also look at the ways in which black people have been resistant in the face of systems of oppression. And so we also talk about historical systems of oppression and the remnants of those systems that still live on in society today and the impact that it has um, on Black people in Canada. Dear Black people, uh, the second uh, week of Unit 2 is where we pay homage to Blacks that have contributed to this nation. And so at the very beginning of uh, this unit, there's actually a letter that is read to Black people that talks about the resilience and the resistance and um, the fortitude that uh, Black people have exhibited. Uh, in Canada. In Dear White People, we look at uh, the misconceptions around the issues of the social construction of being white, white privilege, and white supremacy. And in Black Lives Matter too, we look at the origins of the movement, um, how the Black Lives Matter Canada chapter began, and the transnational relationship between the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and in Canada. And then um, the last unit, we look at the Black Queer Lives Matter. So we look at um, the situation of Black queer lives and what they have experienced in uh, the pride space in terms of oppression and how they have uh, forged ahead. 
<clears throat> in unit three, this is where we talk about um, really the resistance and the resilience of uh, the Black experience in Canada. So we look at the civil rights movement in Canada, and we look at um, the catalytic moments responsible for generating uh, a civil rights movement in Canada. Um, we also look at the individuals responsible for um, generating change and contributing to uh, uh, civil rights legislation. And <clears throat> we also have an opportunity, students also have an opportunity to look at um, some landmark cases that were responsible for acting as a catalyst towards the civil rights movement. So students, for example, get an opportunity to do a deeper dive um, into the story and into the actual court case of Viola Desmond. In the fourth unit, we talk about um, healing. Uh, and for me, again, this was um, another unit that Jamia Zubri worked on, which again, she did a phenomenal job. And it was such a pleasure, um, you know, just thinking about uh, this unit and how it would be incorporated into the course, because I know for myself growing up in the education system and going through post-secondary education, there was never an opportunity to take a course like this, uh, much less a course that talked about healing from uh, trauma and utilizing um, certain um, practices to, to, to heal from trauma and intergenerational trauma. And so in this unit, uh, students will be introduced to both American and Canadian practitioners and some of the practices that they utilize um, in healing from trauma. And then in the last unit, uh, we talk about um, conversations about race. So we look at the nature of race talk in the first lesson. Um, the second lesson, we look at the barriers to race talk. Uh, so why is it difficult for us to have productive conversations about race? And then in the third unit, or sorry, the third lesson, real talk, let's talk about race we begin to move towards um, how to have more productive conversations about race. So in this unit, there's quite a bit of case studies, um, opportunities for students to look through scenarios and to see where um, there are opportunities to have productive conversations. Um, students are able to um, look through various scenarios to see why certain conversations about race break down and is not productive, but more importantly is that this unit offers students an opportunity to critically think and to analyze and um, to come up with uh, ways to have more productive conversations about race. So in this unit, conversations about race, it's really about conversations that deal with um, the topic of, of race. Um, in this unit, faculty will also have an opportunity to look at and review strategies that they can utilize uh, when they have um, in-class conversations uh, about race or conversations about race outside of class as well. Now, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about um, my thinking behind the delivery methodology and the student engagement. So for this course, there there's quite a bit of thinking that I did in terms of um, thinking about the layout and the kinds of assessments that I, that I wanted. Um, I thought about the kind of course that I would wanna take uh, if I was still in school. I thought about the online courses that I've taught and the online courses that I, that I personally um, took. I thought about what I did not want and what I wanted to exist in an online course. And so in doing all of that, um, I wanted to make sure that this was a course that had constant engagement. Um, sometimes when we're taking online courses, there's a lot of great content, a lot of great information, but there's not always an opportunity for students to gauge their learning um, as they go along. So we have a lot of content and then maybe arbitrarily we might have a midterm test or a quiz. Um, and I wanted, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted the assessments to be intentional. So there's a number of assessments, both formal and informal in this course. Uh, there's a number of case studies, um, online readings, 
documentaries and video snippets and infographs. Um, they're both formative and summative assessments and group discussions and reflections that all center around um, the content. Uh, so there is a constant uh, feedback loop between faculty and students and also multiple assessments designed in such a way so that students can gauge their learning and faculty would also be able to see where there may be gaps um, in students learning and address it um, in a meaningful way. So in this course, there is no, you know, sort of generic test, there's no midterm exam, there's no final exam, there's no test. And um, that was intentional. And that's not to say that I'm not a fan of those things. I've, I have used those kinds of tests, of course. But I, I wanted to uh, design the course in such a way where I guess my, my, my thinking was that those are not the only markers of, of students learning. Um, while you know we can use tests and we can use midterm exams, um, I wanted to just uh, go a different route. And so uh, I provided students with um, the kind of assessments where they can arrive at the um, correct answer. Uh, so we don't have any canned questions where the answer is sort of a given. Students are given an opportunity to um, take a scenario or a lesson and right away they're given an opportunity to apply, to apply the information in a systematic way to arrive at um, the right conclusion. So um, I wanted to ensure that there was quite a variety of assessments. And also, um, it was very important for me, as I'm sure it is in creating any online course, um, that the course meet the employability standards as set out by um, the Ministry of, of Training for colleges and universities. And so students do have an opportunity to apply uh, systematic approaches to problem solving, um, managing the use of their time. So uh, at the beginning of every uh, unit, students are actually given a timetable of how to manage their time so that they get all of the assessments and the activities completed. And then at the end of every unit for this course, um, there is a checklist. So students can um, go back and ensure that they've completed all that they need to complete for that lesson. Um, the goal was really trying to put students in the best position possible to succeed um, for this course. And then lastly, um, I said a little bit about this at the beginning, but I wanted to create a course in such a way where it would motivate students from two vantage points. So there's been a lot of research um, on what motivates students to learn. And one of the things that motivates students to learn is um, out of personal interest and enjoyment. So the kinds of um, documentaries and the various modes of learning that were chosen for this course um, kept in mind um, student engagement, wanted to keep students engaged throughout the course. And so while there are documentaries um, that students uh, will have an opportunity to watch, there are also short snippet videos um, that contextualize lessons. And then there are a series of activities that give students an opportunity to apply um, the information. And then um, students are also motivated by learning based on the research um, from the vantage point of wanting to succeed for the purpose of accomplishing a specific goal or outcome. And so it was really important to provide students with an opportunity to aim high. So while there is no uh, formal test or midterm exam or final exam for this course, students will have an opportunity at the end of the course to submit um, a capstone project for the degree course um, and a diploma, um, final, final project for the diploma version of this course. Um, and again, it provides students with an opportunity to pool all of this information together and to present it in a meaningful way where the instructor can also see how the students are learning. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Um, I'll open the floor for any comments or questions that people may have. Thank you so much, uh, Nicolette. This is this is an outstanding project. We do have one question in the chat for you. It says, if we don't have room in the curriculum for the full course, do you think unit two could stand alone within another course? 
Mm, that's a good question. I would say yes. Um, in fact, any of these units, when, when we were, when Jimmy and I were, were working on this course, um, we thought about the fact that, you know, all of these units, unit one through five could stand on its own. <laughs> so um, unit two definitely um, could stand on, on its own um, and be used in, in a course, absolutely. Perfect. Um, while we wait to see if there's any more questions from our audience, I did have one question for you. Um, the value of this open resources is that it can expand ex its impact by being constantly reused. So I was just wondering, as a creator of this course, what would you like educators in this webinar who, who might be interested in reusing your course to know while, while they implement it with their learners? Mm, that's a good question. I'm going to ask you to repeat that one more time. So I have more time to think of the answer. Okay. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, I do see we have another question if you want to think about that one in the meantime. Okay. It says, can you tell us more about the capstone project? Okay, so um, the capstone project for the degree students um, is a project that will require the, the, the degree students to do some research. So I'm a big fan of um, universal design for learning and providing students with options of how to show how they're learning. So for the capstone project for the degree, the students have an opportunity to look at an art form um, and to look at the ways in which, for example, anti-Black racism in that art form um, has been addressed in the past and how it's being addressed in the present. So the art form could be country music, it could be um, uh, a documentary that they're referencing, it could be a movie, it could be a piece of literature, whatever it is. Um, students have an opportunity to either do this video presentation as a group or individually and to show the ways in which anti-Black racism um, has been addressed. Um, there are three options. They can either do it by themselves as a group or they can write um, an essay. And that capstone would be worth 30%. So again, some students are not fans of working in groups. So I do provide the option for um, doing a presentation on their own. And then there are some students who would just rather write an essay because they're good at it. And then there are students who they're not really good at writing essays. So this is an opportunity to showcase their creativity. And so they can either do an individual or a group presentation. Excellent. So they definitely have options to, to choose from. Yeah. Um, we have one more minute left, so I see, um, just wondering if our audience has any other questions or Nicolette, if there's any insights um, that you had through the creation of this course that you would like to share with, with other educators and learners um, joining us today. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things. One is, I really wanted to make this course student-centered. So sometimes as educators, uh, we are comfortable teaching a certain way. And so uh, for this course, it really was about centering the student. Um, and part of that is allowing students to show you how they learn in various modes. Um, so, um, that was really important. And I think moving forward, whether it's in class or whether it's online, it's important to have that approach in mind, how to make the learning student-centered and providing students with um, options to showcase their learning. Um, and then also, I would like to say that in teaching this course, uh, it's really an opportunity for faculty to learn as well, um, because we do help students to um, you know, critically think, but we don't have all the answers as well. So as you're going through the course, I would encourage faculty to go through the readings, go through the documentaries. Um, there are a few required readings, but there's a lot of good supplemental reading that is in the course outline. So feel free to utilize those resources um, in helping you as well in, in, in teaching, this, um, teaching this course. Well, thank you so much, Nicolette, for sharing this with us today. Um, I'm sure it's been very valuable for all of us to learn about the thinking behind this creation. So thank you so much. 
I will introduce now our second presenter of the day. Um, Stevie Jonathan uh, is unit manager at Six Nations Polytechnique, and she's going to share with us uh, the session Using a Good Mind to Research and Create Open Education Resources. In 2021, Six Nations Polytechnique began researching and developing their first ever open education resource titled Exploring Indigenous Foods and Food Sovereignty. This OER examines food sovereignty and food experiences in Haudenosaunee communities, the importance of using the principles of a good mind in indigenous research, and the overall OER development process will be discussed in this section. So without further ado, um, the virtual floor is yours, Stevie. Sego sego wego, yonte hizo ki yaso kani akono ni waga shanta, waga wakwenzo da otahioni ni waga shanta, oswege tibitro. So sego everyone or hello everyone. My name is Stevie Jonathan, and I am Mohawk Nation Wolf Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River. So our open education resource titled Exploring Indigenous Foods and Food Sovereignty examines food sovereignty and experiences in Haudenosaunee communities, specifically Six Nations of the Grand River. And we're looking to enhance this local practice of food sovereignty. And this became particularly important during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw that Six Nations is very much food insecure and water insecure. From this research, we found that local education about food sovereignty and indigenous foods and practices must be achieved to promote these concepts in the lives of Six Nations of the Grand River community members. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives 4.0 international license, and includes materials on indigenous knowledge of Haudenosaunee peoples of Six Nations of the Grand River Indigenous history, the knowledge have not always been respected or portrayed accurately. So we ask that when introducing this resource, you correctly and completely acknowledge the IK it contains. As more and more open education resources become available, it's important to have the discussions around respectful research and creation of these resources in order to protect Indigenous knowledges. So this is what I'll be focusing on today. In Presentation. According to Joanne Archibald's Indigenous story, Indigenous story work, there are three types of stories. There is Indigenous or Indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge overall is interwoven and cannot be detected. So this can be historical or sacred, personal and familial, and each of those aspects include one and the other. Along with Indigenous knowledge has different types of Indigenous ownership, depending on which type of Indigenous knowledge it is, as long, along with rights and responsibilities. Again, this ownership is interwoven and cannot be separated. However, the most ethical thing to do as a researcher and curriculum developer is maintain intellectual property rights of those sharing knowledge. Along with Indigenous knowledge comes great responsibility both as a storyteller and as a listener, so it's important to use the values of the good mind. As a storyteller and listener, you must both consider that speaking and hearing reception may differ between peoples, and hearing reception also differs, and what is understood by one is not going to be understood by everyone. There are implicit meanings within teachings and stories, and adapting stories from a language or cultural perspective to fit into a Western language and ideology can create risks to the knowledge itself, knowledge sharing and the documentation of it. There are obviously risks of appropriation by those who don't fully understand and indigenous stories or knowledges are often not about point A to B to C but are complex and interwoven. Indigenous knowledge and its acquisition is a lifelong process. <clears throat> Also, the stories are to be understood holistically, not to be understood in parts, but as the bigger whole of all of the stories. Indigenous knowledge, again, is that lifelong learning process, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and also some other responsibilities that come along with this. Now we'll dive a little bit deeper into 
some of the ethics that's particularly needed here. The first being obtaining permission to enter a territory. And I would also go further to say it is important to know the history of the territory. For example, Six Nations has a complex history of attempts at assimilation and overthrowing our traditional governance system. So there's two separate bodies to obtain permission from. There's the Six Nations elected band council implemented as part of the Indian Act. And there's also the Hereditary Chiefs Council, which is our traditional governance system that is still in effect today. Secondly, you need to respect cultural protocol. There's also the protocol of handling verification responsibly, responsibly, and I'll talk about this later when I'm discussing asking community. When using published or archival materials, it is important to wake up that material by asking the authors or Indigenous people involved for verification of information and permission to use it. Again, intellectual property rights must maintain, be maintained with the storytellers or those sharing that information. And finally, expertise doesn't equate to cultural authority. This is a, an important concept that we need to explore a little bit deeper as we go into open education resources and micro credentials that are inclusive of Indigenous knowledge. Cultural authority means when we're referring to community members, it's someone who actively contributes to their community. They have long-standing kinship ties that are not just blood family, but true, truly meaningful and current relationships within that community. And they are key, key stakeholders in whatever the research question is. So now that we've established some foundational knowledge about Indigenous knowledges and the different considerations that we must have, I'll now just remind the audience, my main question here is how is research and open education resources involving Indigenous knowledge done respectfully? To answer this question, it is using the values of the good mind as guiding principles throughout the research and development process. The good mind is a Haudenosaunee teaching found within our oral traditions and history, including the creation story and the great law of peace. It can be trans roughly translated from Gatibolio or the good mind or Gatibolio to a way of thinking and living according to Ongoho and Neha, which means um, the native way for lack of better words or translation with peace, love, positive intent and strength. The research and development process is fairly simple. When conducting this work, the first thing I did was listen to community, include community, and then I went back and asked my community again if what I've captured is what they told me. It's important to note that this process is iterative. You might be at one stage and need to go back to the beginning because you've been given a new or learning opportunity. This iterative process is what makes Indigenous research so unique and the journey to acquiring knowledge so valuable to people. It provides opportunity for growth. So if even if you need to start over in your plans, you are still constantly moving forward to a new understanding. The first step in my research and development process of the OER was listening to my community. And this might be familiar more with researchers as primary research. So I did surveys, interviews, focus groups, and I took a semi-structured approach at the maximum, which allowed me to be flexible and mindful and open to concepts of reciprocity. And during this process, I was also continually mindful of the values of the good mind, which I've shared here on the left-hand side which include fairness, sharing, honesty, kindness, confidentiality, consistency, integrity, responsibility, responsiveness, cooperation, openness, and trustworthiness. This is actually a graphic that we have posted around Six Nations Polytechnic campuses um, and also included within our materials that we hand out to teaching staff and students. So all everyone at the SP community is expected to follow these values of the good mind throughout our behavior. And then I've just later applied this to my research as a framework and guiding principles. The second phase of research and development was to include community, which meant including them in curriculum writing, the course pilots, um, sharing resource drafts and collecting their feedback, 
and also sharing the feedback that we obtained through surveys and also course evaluations. So as I mentioned earlier, this is very much an iterative process. So at any process, I might have to go back to the beginning and revisioning exactly what my research question was, um, which did take some time, but it, it again, it creates growth and, and a new understanding. So it's always a good process. Finally, I asked community. I went back to a review committee comprised of subject matter experts as well as knowledge holders to make sure that my understanding is of what I'm being told throughout this process is consistent with my organization's mission and vision and also the values that we have for cultural and language revitalization, making sure that my research findings are consistent with the values of the good mind. So making sure every part of those values here on the left are consistent and integrated through the research development process and also the results. So this process was very valuable to gain new understandings and insights and making sure that we have a clear, clearly defined um, open education resource that is representative of our organization and the Six Nations community. And of course, the ultimate goal you want to be cognizant of throughout the process is the protection of Indigenous knowledge, which can be achieved using the values of the good mind as guiding principles. So just to reiterate here, when you're going through the process of listening, including and asking community, making sure that you have fairness, sharing, honesty, kindness, confidentiality, consistency, integrity, responsibility, responsiveness, cooperation, openness, and trustworthiness. Because protection of Indigenous knowledge in itself is so critical. Um, I think it's important to think of Indigenous knowledge as a being or in itself. So affording Indigenous knowledge the same respect and integrity that you would uh, a person. Um, and protecting that person. Um, so that's all I wanted to share today, and I'm very much open to questions if there are any. Thank you so Thank much, Stevie. We do have a first question, first question. in the chat. It says, it it says were you says, able to reciprocate for a community member's time, ex for example, through honoraria or et cetera? Yes, definitely. That is something that our organization takes um, very seriously is compensating for Indigenous knowledge and community members. So we have an honor place already, um, which diff actually differs between um, community members, students, and, and others, and also having even a higher value that we would for someone at a PhD level for that of knowledge holders. So we equate those with Indigenous knowledge and knowledge guardians as having almost like a PhD in Indigenous knowledge. So we make sure that we're compensating accordingly. Um, I'm sorry, Stevie. I think we lost your audio just for a little bit. So if you don't mind repeating the answer, just yeah. I just want to make sure that everyone um, could hear it. Yeah, no problem. So I was just saying that we do have an honorarium policy that values our, our community members um, and compensates them accordingly. Um, and we also very much highly value those who carry our Indigenous knowledge. So we pay them the, the same rates that we would with someone who is an expert or PhD level. I am so sorry. I think the technical issues are now on my end because I can't hear you, but Mary, my colleague, will help me continue this conversation if you can hear me. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience with this. I'm just going to step in and I'll hold on to uh, right now. Stevie, are you okay? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't really hear you that that well, Mary. You're cutting out a little bit, um, but I do have the chat in front of me that says, what was your favorite part of putting together the course? Uh, for me, it very much was engaging with community and listening to their stories and 
I came into different conversations asking them, what is your experiences with food sovereignty? And I personally learned so much about food sovereignty practices. Um, so that was really valuable. So I don't think that's something that people in academics get a lot of time to do as part of the development process is to simply go and talk to people and have those important conversations. Thanks, TV. Sorry about that. I was having some technical okay. issues at my end and couldn't hear you better. All good now. Um, let me just check if we have any more questions. In the meantime, I did have a question for you. Um, as a creator of this open educational resource, I was wondering what would you like other educators or people interested in reusing your OER to know or to have in mind as they reuse it? Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, respecting and being knowledge and really thinking about it as, as a person in itself. So affording them the same credit, the same, the same credits that you would as, as a person. Um, and really, as someone mentioned in the chat, having that deeper connection is so critical um, between each other and establishing relationships is critical to knowledge dissemination. Um, whether it's indigenous knowledge or other knowledge, it's important to have that deep connection with whatever it is that you're working with. Um, so yeah, just, just taking it to a new level and really connecting with yourself and allowing yourself personal growth um, and sharing that knowledge with others. Excellent. And I'm also wondering what were your personal learnings through the process of creating this OER that were more interesting to you or more meaningful to you as you went through the through the journey? <clears throat> so for me, I think a deeper connection or new understanding that I had through this process was not just the process itself of having those relationships with my community, um, but also within the content, it gave me a new understanding of how deeply connected as women to, um, to that process of growing and food sovereignty and being able to care for one another and the importance of community in that as well. Um, women really truly play a key role in, in ensuring cultural continuity for Haudenosaunee people. Um, so I think that was very eye-opening for me is to understand new roles and responsibilities of Haudenosaunee women. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really great experience and there was a lot to learn. Um, I think community plays a huge role and it was something that was really special because we were still in the COVID-19 pandemic as we were doing this research. So being, you know, socially distancing or physical distancing from people had really created that gap of, of relationship building. But this was one way that I was able to get that back and, and really have um, that community feeling again. But it's new ways of community engagement, but even more critical in those these times of social distancing. Um, yes. I see have one more question for you. It says, can you share with us some context about the activities in the OER? <clears throat> yeah, so there's two activities within our OER. There is one that is creating a three sister soup. It's like more of a colloquial term, I would say. Um, but the three sisters are squash, beans, and corn. And that OER actually discusses how those three food varieties support each other in growth through at the nutrient level and also within the physical growth level. So ideally, if you are growing three sisters, you want to grow them on a mound, approximately five feet um, and maybe about two, two feet high. And your corn is going to be in the middle. And then outside of that corn, you're going to have your um, pole climbing beans, and they're going to grow up the corn stalk. So the corn actually supports the beans grow. And then outside of that, in the outer ring, you're going to have your squash, which provides, um, you know, squash has really big, beautiful leaves, and they're a little bit prickly as well. Um, so that keeps the beans shaded um, and keeps all of the soil shaded so it maintains moisture. 
gives it's going to keep away and so it kind of creates a very um sustainable ecosystem in itself with each mound um and then so we talk about that within the oer and then we also tell people how to prepare it so even if you haven't grown your own quarantine and squash, you can still go to the grocery store and, and pick a, you know, some healthy varieties and healthy options and prepare it after your family. Um, and then as you're preparing that, you know, you're, you're being thankful for the food that you have, because as we can see through the COVID-19 pandemic, there are a lot of places within Canada that are food insecure. So being mindful and grateful for, for the things that you have um, and sharing that story with with your family and um, really taking some guidance from our food systems um, for how people should be. You know, we should be supporting each other the same way that the three sisters do. Right, thank you so much. Um, wondering if our audience has any more questions for Stevie? In the meantime, Stevie, what, what do you think are, are your main hopes when people reuse this OER and learn how to apply the principles of the good mind in, in, in OER research and development? What are, what, how would you summarize your, your main goals? For me, my main goal is to, to take that knowledge and do with it what you can to the best of your ability. Um, people are going to be in different situations. Um, so with that being said, if you're able to um, grow a garden, grow your own food um, and really, you know, take some, some initiative to do that with your family, teach your family members, your children, um, so that they can be food secure have they, have, have they ever needed to be. Um, and then also sharing that knowledge with each other, sharing your foods with each other and trading is really important. Um, it opens up a new way of life that are that we've become disconnected to, not just indigenous people, but any people around the world. We all engaged in, in food sovereignty. We had our own gardens, our own planting, our own food systems. So getting back to that simpler way of life will be really beneficial for, for health, for economy, um, and much more. Perfect. It's something that we all we all share. So, uh, there's lots of praise for you in the chat. So thank you. This is very informative. This is great. Uh, a wonderful presentation. Um, we do have four minutes left. So if anyone has any other questions, um, take advantage of this time we have with Stevie to pick her brain and share her experience. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to share, Stevie, with our audience today? Um, yes, um, I'll say that the Open Education Resource does touch the importance of our foods, our traditional foods and our, our food systems. Um, so I would encourage others to kind of delve a little bit deeper into the creation story and the great law to see just how critical and important our foods are to our identity and cultural maintenance. Um, so you can look up different resources that I have within the um, resource section there. Um, the creation story is a really good one to see, you know, find out new connections to our foods. Um, and also there's another great book called The Guyana Lagoa by Guyanasa Paul Williams. Um, that's a really good resource. Um, yeah, there's tons of resources out there. Um, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Well, and I'll say that Gunna Wage did a really amazing work on food sovereignty. So definitely check out Gunna Wage's um, projects that they have going on. Excellent. And just in time, because we do have one more question, um, two more questions. First one, should educators and curriculum developers engage with the resource as a whole, or can parts of it be used? I would say parts of it can definitely be used. 
as long as you like have that understanding that of of looking at things in the whole, um, you can definitely still use the parts of it for sure. Perfect. And the other question from Rachel is, Stevie, does the resource include information on the mm -hmm. values of the good mind and the indigenous research methods and guiding principles you spoke about? I actually don't think it does. Um, so that's why I definitely wanted to do the presentation today to kind of talk about the process a little bit more. Um, but you can definitely contact me if you if you want me to share share my PowerPoint here. Um, I'm definitely open to people reusing that. Okay, that, that was a good consideration. Um, Rama also says, thank you for this insight and resource that highlights the importance of food sovereignty and our relationship with food. So thank you so much for, for joining us today and for sharing this thinking behind how you designed the OER. Uh, it was a great resource and a great presentation and it was a pleasure um, speaking with you today. Yes, it was my pleasure as well. Nyao to everyone who said Nyao or Nyao in the chat and Nyao Goa to everyone here and to our, our moderators. I had a great time as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for our audience, remember at 2 p.m. today, we have our last session of this VLS open house. So join us to know more about reality, extended reality content that is now available through the open library. So thank you so much, everyone.